All right. Good morning, everyone. Or good evening, good night. Uh, if you're joining us online, good afternoon. Uh, I'm still adjusting to my time zone here, but I, I hope you are with us. It's so, uh, such a pleasure to welcome everyone here. My name is Timi Oshuto. I am Global Digital Policy Lead at the International Chamber of Commerce. Um, we've convened uh, this little session. If you're wondering if you're in the right room, um, this is session uh, 196 uh, on evolving AI, evolving governance from principles to action. Um, I will be your moderator today, um, and we just sharing a couple of quick questions uh, for you um, and a couple of thoughts. Um, as we as we start, um, we have um, a little slide that I hope can go up soon um, to really try and test your knowledge uh, as the panel here uh, shortly starts speaking. Um, why is because this session is really here to to take stock of all the various um, initiatives uh, that we have going around. Um, policy conversations in intergovernmental, multi-stakeholder, uh, business-led uh, settings to try and cope with this question of how are we governing um, this um, all-purpose technology uh, that we call artificial intelligence. Although if you were in the session yesterday, um, there were a couple of alternative names offered <laughs> to what really this is. But let's just call it artificial intelligence for, for simplicity's sake. Um, so um, as we start our panel and as I give a little intro here on what we're trying to achieve, I invite you to scan the QR code. Um, you'll have a poll there. Um, so please just uh, share uh, for our information, the panel's information on how to structure their comments, um, what, um, what you think, the, the, um, how familiar you are with some of these main initiatives that we have. And I'm going to invite my panelists to do the same because in order to see the results, you will also have to scan the QR codes. Um, so let's all do that together uh, while I'll try also to give you an introduction on the purpose of this, uh, of this session. So, uh, why we convene this session, um, as I said, uh, in recent years, uh, AI, I mean, has, AI has been present for a very long time, but, sorry, just trying to get to my QR code here. Um, AI has been present for a while now, uh, but what, what, I think what happened in recent years is, is it really, um, it really started growing in, in popularity and user friendliness. And that has put us into questioning whether our frameworks that we have in dealing with this technology are really um, apt or, or up, to, uh, up to standard, uh, shall we call it. Um, another question that we have with all these different spaces trying to deal with this question, um, are we aligned? Are we aware of one another? Are we working in unison or are we fragmenting this policy space? Um, so this is basically the question that we're trying to answer here. All these diverse um, initiatives and all these diverse panel speakers that are involved across all of these initiatives um, trying to take stock and make sense of what's happening um, and trying to draw a couple of lessons as we really move into governing uh, this global technology at a global scale. Um, so what has happened, what have we learned, and how we move forward uh, is really what we're trying to get here. So I hope while I was doing this little speech, everybody managed to get the QR code and managed to answer the question. Do you still need some time? Okay, well then to see the, the results, you can scan the next QR code. I'll just do it right here. And let's see. Oh, quite a good, quite a good set of results. I'm sorry I can show it on the screen for you, um, but uh, what I will read them out. So the, here are some of the initiatives that we thought are the most popular ones, um, and. Uh, um, on a scale of one to 10, how familiar the audience is with them. The OECD principles on AI uh, lead the way, 5.9 on a scale of 10, of familiarity. <laughs> uh, then on the second place, we have a tie between the UNESCO recommendations on the ethics of AI 
and the G7 Hiroshima AI process. Uh, of course, uh, that probably has, has, <laughs> has grown a lot, in, lot of in popularity these days. Um, so that, that's 5.7 on a scale of 10. Then third uh, place, we have the Council of Europe's Convention on AI and Human Rights, 5.6 on a scale of 10. And then lagging a bit behind uh, remains the NIST AI risk management framework at 3.7 familiarity on a scale of 10. So panel, please um, organize your comments uh, with this in mind <laughs> uh, of how familiar the audience is with some of the things that you might be referencing. Um, but also uh, try and make sure that um, in a way that, that you are presenting, um, we manage to have a dialogue. Um, and without further ado, then let me introduce those um, up here and online um, that will be, will be speaking with you today. First of all, we have online, and I hope uh, she's connected, uh, Ms. Suzanne Akabawi, advisor to the Minister on Data Governance, Ministry of Communication and Information Technology of the Government of Egypt. Suzanne, I hope you're connected. Uh, we're trying to make sure. Uh, on the panel up here, we, I have with me Ms. Maria Paz Canales, Head of Legal Policy and Research at Global Partners Digital. Galia Daor, Policy Analyst at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD. Uh, Owen Larter, Director for Public Policy Responsible AI at Microsoft. Dr. Clara Apple, Senior Director at IEEE European Business Operations. Mr. Nobu Nishigata, Director for Computer and Data Communications Division and the Telecommunications Bureau at the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications of Japan. And joining us today, um, a little later, as they're running in from other session, uh, will be Dr. Sad Center, Deputy Envoy for Critical and Emerging Technologies of the U.S. State Department, Dr. Uh, Mr. Thomas Schneider, Ambassador and Director of International Relations at Ofcom uh, and, uh, and in Switzerland, but also Chair of the Council of Europe's Committee on AI, and Mr. Pratik Sibal, Program Specialist, Digital Innovation and Transformation at the United um, Nations Educational Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO. So we will be joining um, a number of other speakers on stage today. Uh, but without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, our first speaker to share some of the, her thoughts um, on what is it that we've done so far in the space of AI and how we move forward from here. Galia from OECD. Thank you. Um, thank you, Timea, and, and good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Galia Daur, and I'm joining from the OECD. So I have the easiest job because you all apparently know the OECD principles. So I can stop here and hand over to Timea, and we continue the discussion. Um, but if you allow me, then uh, perhaps I will say a few words about um, the OECD AI principles, and in particular, uh, what we've been doing since their adoption in, in 2019 to support countries and organizations in the implementation of these principles. Um, so, as obviously you're all aware, the, the principles were adopted in 2019 as a set of five values-based principles and five recommendations to policymakers, uh, together the 10 OECD AI principles. Um, and and the, in particular, the, the five values-based principles define what we see as trustworthy AI, um, what AI needs to be to, to be considered trustworthy. So uh, principles like transparency and explainability, uh, respect for human rights, accountability, um, safety and security, and robustness. Um, so, so that's just part of the list. Um, since 2019, we've, we've developed a set of actions uh, to support their implementation. So uh, we, we've, one thing that we've been doing is um, building the evidence base. Uh, so we have a platform, online platform called OECD.ai that I recommend you check out. Uh, you all have your lap laptops and phones. So, um, and, and that is um, the sort of the, the, the public evidence base that we have on AI. In, in particular, it includes um, a database of national AI strategies and policies uh, already covering over 70 countries um, and a lot of different sets of data and metrics for uh, measuring AI, uh, including research publications, including uh, jobs and skills demand, 
um, including um, investment in AI broken down into uh, specific subsets like AI compute and generative AI. Um, so, so that's sort of part of the, the evidence-based piece. Uh, in addition, um, we've worked on um, the expanding our expertise. So we have a network of experts, of AI experts, um, now uh, consisting of over 400 experts uh, from a variety of countries um, and a variety of disciplines. Um, and that allows us to both be sort of technically accurate, but also uh, to make sure that we can adapt to changes. So uh, we've adapted the, the, the work of, these, of this network um, to, for example, uh, now we have a network uh, expert group on AI compute. Uh, we have an um, expert group on AI futures, and that's how we sort of um, adjust our policies uh, with time. Um, the other thing that we've been working on is practical concrete tools for implementation. Um, and that includes our uh, work on AI risk management uh, and risk assessment, uh, including the OECD uh, classification uh, um, framework for AI systems. So looking at how we can classify uh, AI systems based on the, the, the different risks that they, they pose and taking into account the, the context, um, the data, the input, um, and, and sort of seeing that different systems have different risks and that needs to be taken into account in, in policy making. Um, and in addition to, so this is maybe to understand the risks, we also have tools to address those risks. So we have a catalog of um, tools for trustworthy AI, which is really a compilation of tools that exist out there um, that different actors use um, from, from technical tools to educational tools. Um, and so this is an interactive database that anyone can access and, and sort of see what, what is already there that you can take and, and use in your um, in your context. So maybe that's a, a, a moment to say, um, I don't know, we're talking about sort of good practices and, and implementation. So I think one thing that we can say from our experience is, it sounds obvious, especially in this context, but I think it's still important to say, um, it's really important to be as expansive and inclusive as possible. That's why we're covering um, 70 and counting countries in our database. That's why we have uh, this um, expansive network of experts. And I think that's why also we come here and have this conversation uh, with you. Um, and so continuing maybe to uh, maybe one more minute about our, our um, work on AI risk assessment and risk management. Um, so we, we will soon launch a, a report that sort of looks at and goes back to Timea's point about there's many things out there. Um, so we tried to zeroing in on specifically on the risk component to see what frameworks exist and what they might have in common. And um, this is a report that, as I said, will be uh, published in, in a couple of weeks. Um, but it let, let us see that sort of at a high level, a lot of these frameworks that exist uh, have the same phases in common. So they have sort of a define, assess, treat, govern phase in, in all of them. But if you go into the details, then there are differences, in particular when you, we go to the govern, the, the how you govern the risk in, in your organization. And I think that's sort of a... Uh, first step into how these things can can work together. Um, another thing that we're working on is an AI incidents monitor, so to look at um, in, in real time, uh, based on sort of real world data, what um, what uh, harms AI systems can uh, do, not can do, uh, uh, cause. Um, and so, so that helps us obviously both to be aware of those uh, harms, but also to inform um, our work and, and sort of to let others inform their uh, work on, on AI. Um, this maybe leads me to my last point, which is the challenge that we see in that, which is um, there is a lot of information and data and policies out there, and it's, it can be challenging to sort of make sense of all of that in a way that is um, really practical. So one thing that we're developing is an AI index that will let uh, have you so one metric of is a policy um, trustworthy or what is the trustworthiness score of an AI policy. So that's maybe a step towards compiling all this information and give you a number that hopefully can sort of give you some sort of an uh, informed uh, basis for, for decisions. Uh, but I, I still think this is, this is a real challenge. Um, so I, I really would like to l love to hear what others have to say about that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kalia, for, for that uh, comprehensive overview and, and sharing all the work that uh, uh, the OECD is doing. 
um, we have asked if people are aware of the OECD's principles. Maybe we should have asked if they're aware of some of these initiatives that you mentioned. Uh, but if you're not, uh, do look them up. Um, uh, there, there's a lot of good work being done there. Um, so now that we've heard from, from Galia, I'm going to be jumping between international and national approaches uh, uh, on the panel, try and see how some of this international um, ideas uh, and, and s norms and principles that we've set uh, commonly at a global level, how they translate back into national implementation or implementation by various stakeholder groups, whether that is in uh, a company, uh, in an organization, um, or, uh, or, or a standard setting body, maybe. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn to Nishikata-san um, to discuss how do you see um, the OECD's work and other uh, international work translated into national work uh, in Japan, and what is really the nexus uh, between um, these principles, regulation, and then innovation? Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Nobu Nishigata. Good morning to everybody here. Welcome to Kyoto on behalf of the, the hosting government uh, for the IGF this year. So the next deck, please. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is just who I am. Uh, my, I'm doing that uh, the division director at the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications. And um, I, I, I covered many things, and for, for particularly for the idea of its internet, then I'm going to ICANN meeting, uh, doing some internet governance within Japan and both abroad, and then here. Since I used to work at the OECD with the Garia, uh, during the 2017 to 21, uh, when uh, the OECD developed the Council recommendation, uh, which is OECD A principle now, and uh, I, I had, it is very happy to hear that the, 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 the we made the top of the recognition <laughs> among the initiatives the, the, the presented by the, the moderator this morning. So, and then, then the next slide, please, and then. Uh, Today I'm talking the other things. Uh, of course, I'm talking about uh, some nexus between the innovation and the uh, initiatives on the AI policies. But uh, let me introduce some history of the, the AI policies discussion in the international fora. And I believe one of the beginning it is uh, 2016 when Japan hosted the G7 meetings, and we had a very good uh, ministerial meeting among the ICT ministers at, at the time. So then before that, of course, G7 takes place every year. Then the chairs take turns among the seven countries. But before 2016, then, then we, we didn't have too many uh, ministerial meetings on digital or ICT or communication, et cetera. It was the first time after the more than 20 years to host a ministerial meeting for ICT. Then, then the you know, it passed it around the Italy, then the Canada, France, US, and et cetera. And then, then like, uh, now we had uh, the Hiroshima AI process and the second round of our chair in the G7 this year. So then, then we had many things then happening, like, uh, for example, 2019, uh, the G7 the France chair, French chair they introduced uh, the GPA, uh, the Global Partnership on AI. In the same year, the, the Japan hosted the G20 meeting, and uh, G20 agreed on the G20, it's on an AI principles, but it, it is just the same that the, the OECD's principle, it's kind of copy uh, in the same text. Then we have some development in the afterwards, and then it comes to the this year, to 2023. So next slide, please. Uh, next one. Yes, so just it's more kind of history now. It's uh, seven years ago, the photo from Takamatsu, and then we had some discussion, then it's uh, uh, next slide, please. It's gonna show up some detail, yes. So it is the first time that, that uh, at that time, the minister, Mr. Takaichi, uh, the proposals and the, the discussions among the G7 at the time to, to talk about AI, like what the risk, what the opportunity, and then what next? And then the Japan wanted to have some common understanding, common principles to cope with these new technologies at that time. So the, the bottom line, may, maybe the touching upon the, the, the relationship between innovation and regulation, those kind of things, just think about what Japan is right now. We are facing several big social problems that are aging 
and uh, you know we, we need more like uh, people I mean to sustain our economy and then like we need more machines so like uh, Japan is I think I mean, one of the, the kind of edged position to more like uh, we need more machines to help us to sustain the economy the business and etc or even the daily life so we are very much friendly to the AI but of course we recognize some uh, some uncertainties in this technology. So then, then like uh, we started a discussion at the G7, kind of trying to the, how they feel about the AI at the time. Then, fortunately, the, the, our propo proposal on the AI discussion was very much very well received by the member of the G7. So the Japanese government decided to ask the OECD to to continue the work further. Then they came out to the OECD principle in 2019. So that the kind of the beginning of our history of the, what we have now. And then, then the next slide, please. So that's just the introduction. Then, since Gaia didn't have the deck, <laughs> I, I can do it for you for for her. That's what that we see the principle. It's very simple. Ten principles. The first five is more like uh, the value-based principles, and then the other five is more like a recommendation to the policymakers, to the government. Then they just the, the 10 and things. So the next one, please. And this year, the, as the chair of the G7, and then we had the first uh, the hosted the digital and the tech ministers meeting in Takasaki in Japan. And uh, it's not only the AI ministers meeting, so we have like uh, eight themes. Then, then the one is, the, of course, about AI. Then the theme is the responsible AI and the global AI governance. And uh, actually, the ministers discuss more about the interoperability of the AI governance, uh, looking at some, you know, the European countries are working hard for, to, to pass the AI Act on it. Of course, we know it, but on the other hand, still Japan is not the one to introduce the legislation over the AI technologies yet. We, are, we would like more to see to, you know, the more opportunity or possibility of this technology. So in Japan's perspective, it's too early to introduce the legislation over the AI, but on the other hand, we respect what the EU is doing. So then like, uh, we try to, to start the discussion about the in you know, international kind of interoperability in the governance level, uh, so that uh, you know, like we don't we don't want to, to to put more burden on the business side. I mean, of course, like a multinational people should work <laughs> in everywhere in the, in this globe. So that that the 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 thinking about the, the proposal. Then then the next slide, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, then like uh, so. Uh, the, before the, the ministerial meeting, we are thinking more about the interoperability, but now sometimes the, the, this kind of things happen in, in the G7 things, like uh, escalation to the leaders. So then like, what happened is like, uh, the leaders are going to, to create uh, or establish the, what we say, Hiroshima AI process. And uh, the discussion is more focused on the generative AI and uh, the foundation model, the new technology. And then now, the, again, the, we are asking the OECD to some support to uh, summarize the report for the stock taking and the risk about risk and the challenge and the opportunities on the new technology, particularly for the G generative AI. Then, uh, of course, the, 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 the goal is uh, some development of the code of conduct in organizations or like a project basis, project based cooperation to support the development of the new. Uh, responsible AI tools and the best practices. Then like, you can see the uh, link here, then this is kind of ministerial declaration in September. Then, then the, the G7 delegates are uh, the working hard to, to compile the report, which is mandated to report to the leaders by the end of this year. And do we have more? Oh, no, so that's about it. So in the end, uh, coming back to the point from the moderator, like, uh, so Japan is more, want more to see that the new technology can do, particularly for our society. I mean, not only Japan, but also the whole world. So thank you very much. Thank you. That was a, a really good overview uh, of what influences uh, perhaps the space that a national 
government or, 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 or an organization has to deal with uh, when we're thinking about how we set international uh, principles uh, and guidelines, how do we make them, how do we bring them home, and then how do we bring our own issues um, that we have in our own societies and economies back into these sp spaces to, um, to shape um, some of those responses. Um, so that was a very nice full circle there. To continue on this track of um, how national um, governments um, deal with uh, the international policy space um, and, and how do they bring their own um, opinions into it, we're going to move from Japan to Egypt, from the room uh, online, um, and we're going to hear from uh, Ms. Suzanne Akabawi. Um, Suzanne, I hope you are well connected and you can hear us. We can yes, see you. I can. And we can hear yeah. you. The floor is yours. Perfect. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, the opportunity to uh, to take part in this uh, very interesting discussion, and uh, with uh, such an esteemed panel panel of guests. Um, I'm Susanna Rakhavewi. I am an advisor to the Minister uh, of ICT uh, on data governance. Uh, so this stage a bit about how um, uh, we are moving uh, towards the, uh, creating an infrastructure, uh, institutional, and legal, and technical infrastructure um, to um, uh, be in line with the technological advancements uh, that are happening. And uh, clearly uh, in relation to AI as well. So just to give you a bit of background, Egypt uh, uh, has a national uh, AI strategy uh, that uh, aims to create an, a an AI industry in Egypt. Um, it also wishes to exploit uh, AI technology to serve Egypt's uh, development goals. Um, the AI strategy uh, was built on uh, four pillars, uh, AI for government, AI for development, uh, capacity building and international relations. Uh, it also set uh, and has four enablers, uh, governance, data, uh, ecosystem and infrastructure. Um, uh, it was the, the strategy was uh, drafted according to a model uh, that promotes effective uh, partnership between uh, the government and the private sector um, in a way uh, to create a dynamic work environment um, and to support building uh, digital uh, digital Egypt and achieve digital transformation um, and uh, in, a, in a way that is led by AI application. Uh, one of the main principles uh, of the strategy is that AI uh, should enhance human labor uh, and not re replace it. Um, unlike uh, our uh, friends in Japan, uh, we are uh, a very young society. Um, in majority, uh, uh, the majority of the population is between 16 to 45 years of age. Uh, so um, we face uh, 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 challenges, challenges with respect to uh, the acceptance of AI. Uh, and um, in, in showing that it has positive aspects other than taking away jobs from, uh, uh, from the, uh, this young population. So uh, one of our main principles uh, for the strategy is that AI should enhance human labor and not replace it. Um, and uh, this requires that we conduct a thorough impact assessment for each AI project. Uh, focusing on whether or not the AI uh, is the best solution to the problem uh, at hand and what are the expected social and economic impacts of each new AI system. Um, the strategy also emphasizes the importance of uh, fostering uh, regional and international cooperations. As mentioned earlier, um, uh, we are uh, uh, members of the OECD AI network. Uh, the 70 countries that were mentioned earlier were one of them. Um, uh, recently, we have an active, uh, also we've uh, published uh, an AI uh, charter uh, for responsible uh, 
a charter for responsible AI. Uh, the charter is um, divided into two parts, uh, general guidelines and uh, implementation guidelines. Um, the general guidelines uh, detail give uh, uh, a layer of uh, details about um, how to implement the principles that were uh, uh, in the strategies, in the strategy, and um, so uh, uh, in the general guidelines we have a primary goal of using AI in government. Uh, uh, and uh, it, the, the purpose behind it is to uh, uh, promote the well-being of citizens um, and uh, combating poverty, hunger, inequality, etc., uh, which is in line with the human-centeredness principles. Uh, with respect to any, um, uh, we have the, the the general guidelines also uh, provide that any end user. Uh, using uh, an AI has uh, the fundamental rights to know that they are using uh, and interacting with an AI uh, system. Um, uh, again, uh, 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 a, re um, uh, a reaffirmation that no individual should be harmed by the introduction of an AI system, um, especially uh, uh, with respect to job creation. Um, we the, um, we also have I mean there is a list of uh, of uh, general guidelines that uh, that are present in the document and all in line with the principles uh, that were uh, uh, of the OECD principles. Uh, for the implementation guidelines, which is the second. Uh, uh, part of, um, of the charter, um, it provided that AI should be robust, secure, and safe throughout the entire life cycle, um, that any uh, AI project should be preceded by a pilot uh, and a proof of concept, and that uh, additional measures should be, take, uh, should be in place in case of sensitive and uh, mission critical AI applications. So in short, um, this is the, uh, uh, where we stand. We are in line with the existing uh, uh, principles, guidelines, and frameworks uh, that are, that uh, uh, were um, uh, decided uh, on the international uh, arena, uh, and. Uh, we have uh, a clear uh, understanding of our uh, uh, cultural differences, um, trying to find ways to uh, bridge the gaps, uh, the cultural and sociological gaps uh, uh, that come with the, with the technological advance. Thank you so much, uh, Suzanne, uh, for sharing all of that um, and really emphasizing how um, AI approaches, policies, and frameworks um, need to be responsive um, to uh, national context, cultures, local expectations, uh, while uh, aligning with global uh, values um, and, and also making sure that uh, policies are um, interoperable with some of the um, other countries as um, uh, and, and regional and global initiatives um, so that we can manage towards um, a truly global um, governance uh, goals that we have. Um, so as we've heard from uh, our, our speakers from, uh, from the national government side, um, I'm going to turn um, to some of our um, non-governmental stakeholders, and then I'm going to go full circle and, and go back to um, uh, international initiatives at the end, uh, giving a bit of a breathing time <laughs> to our newest speaker who joined us. Welcome, uh, welcome Thomas. Um, 
So I'm going to turn now to um, uh, Mr. Owen Larter uh, from Microsoft um, and ask you, now that you've heard from um, the international space a little bit and how national governments cope with this, this challenge, um, how does that happen in a, in a private company? Um, what, how do you implement this? How do you come up with some of your own? Um, and how do you um, dialogue with, with these, um, these initiatives? Fantastic. Well, hello, is this on? Can people hear me? Excellent, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. So my name is Owen Larter. I work on responsible AI public policy issues at Microsoft. It's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to be able to, to join such an esteemed panel. Um, so we, we are enthusiastic at Microsoft about the potential of AI. We're excited to see the way in which customers are already using our Microsoft AI co-pilots to be more productive in their day-to-day -day life. And I think more broadly, we see a huge amount of promise in this technology to help us better understand and manage complex systems, and in doing so, respond to major challenges, whether it's in relation to healthcare or the climate or improving education for everyone. But th there are clearly risks. We feel, as a private sector company developing this technology, that we have a real responsibility to lean in and make sure that the technology is developed in a way that is safe and trustworthy. So I sort of wanted to talk about three buckets of responsibilities that I view Microsoft as having to contribute to. The first one is to make sure that we're developing this technology in a way that is responsible. And so we've been building out our responsible AI program for six years now. We've got over 350 people working right across the company on these issues from a real diversity of backgrounds, which we feel is very important. So we have people who are deep in the engineering space, research, legal, policy, people with sociological backgrounds, all coming together to work out how we identify AI risks and then put together a program internally that can help address them. So we've got sort of the core of our program, our responsible AI standard. This is an internal standard. It is based on the OECD principles. It's mm. based around yeah. making sure that people are upholding our AI principles at Microsoft. We've got tens of requirements across our 14 goals, and it really is a rule book. So anyone at Microsoft that is developing or deploying an AI system has to abide by this responsible AI standard. We've also shared this externally now, so anyone could go out and find it online if you type in Microsoft's responsible AI standard. We think this is really important, you know, a, a, to show that we're doing the legwork here and it's not just nice words, but B, so that others can critique it, can build on it, and improve it as well. And then we're building out the rest of our responsible AI infrastructure at Microsoft as well. So we have a sensitive uses team that anytime we're engaging in developing a higher risk system, we bring greater scrutiny, we apply additional safeguards. We have an AI red team that is a centralized team within the company and goes product to product before we release it, making sure that we're evaluating it thoroughly and that we're able to identify, measure, and mitigate any potential risks. So that's that first bucket around responsible development. I also think we as a company and we as an industry, quite frankly, have a real responsibility to lean into governance discussions like this. So we have recently founded the Frontier Model Forum with a number of other leading AI labs. We are trying to accelerate work around technical best practice on Frontier models in particular. So these are the really highly capable models that offer a lot of promise, but also can pose some very significant risks as well. We want to develop that best practice. We want to implement that ourselves as companies, but we also want to share that externally to inform conversations on governance. And we're, we're really pleased to be able to engage internationally in global governance conversations, very supportive of the work that is going on at the UN. You know, the UN doing a very good job, I think, of catalyzing a, a globally representative conversation. Um, UNESCO's uh, recommendations on the, the AI framework, very supportive of it. And of course, all the technical work that is being done by the OECD in the background, very supportive of that as well. And I think the final responsibility we have is, is to lean in and help shape the development of regulation as well. So the self-regulatory steps that we've taken, we feel are really important, but they are just the start. We do feel that this new technology will need new rules. And so we want to lean in. We want to share information about where the technology is going. It's moving in a very, very fast pace. So how can we um, help others sort of understand exactly the trajectory of the technology? We want to share what's working in terms of how we're identifying and mitigating risks internally, and also what's not working, quite frankly. And then finally, we want to help build capacity. I think this is going to be a really key issue to underpin the development of governance frameworks and regulation in the coming years. How do you make sure that governments have the capacity to develop viable, effective regulation? And then also critically, how do you ensure that regulators have the capacity to understand how AI is going to impact their sector, whether it's healthcare, whether it's financial services, and be able to address um, the risks that they may pose? So I'll, I'll stop there for now and pass it back to the chair. Thank you, Owen. Um, I think that 
when, when the picture that, that it paints for me, it was very, very structured. So thank you for that. It always makes the moderator's job easy <laughs> when, when there's a clear one, two, three, four point uh, in, in, in a speech. Um, but what it really strikes me from what you say um, is that through these steps of responsible development, governance, regulation, capacity building, um, multi-stakeholder and cooperation between um, governments, private sector, um, civil society, the technical community, uh, academics, research, um, it's not one or the other. It's not that one sector needs to do this and the other sector needs to do that, but we all need to be at the table at all of those levels um, to really make this work and then actually have to buy in to be able to implement all of this uh, when, when the uh, rubber meets the road. Um, so you referenced um, how Microsoft dialogues and supports some of the UN initiatives. So um, I think that was a good segue to, to turn um, uh, to Pratik and, and ask uh, how does the uh, UNESCO um, think about all this? Uh, you've done um, a lot of work in, in coming up with um, the ethical guidelines um, on AI. Um, you've missed uh, the beginning of the of the of the section. Uh, we've had a little um, poll here to the audience to see um, what are uh, how familiar the audience is with some of the um, AI uh, policy frameworks out there, and and UNESCO is what um, closely second after OECDs. So there's a good understanding of what uh, is in there, I think, in in the in the guidelines. Um, uh, but I think it would be great to hear a little bit about. Um, what you do and how it works when you actually try and implement this, uh, what are the lessons that you've learned, um, and what are the challenges in actually bringing those global principles into um, the national level, uh, building capacity, as Owen mentioned, and, and, and how, how is that working? And how much time do I have? Five minutes. <laughs> okay. Uh, right. Thanks, and apologies for being late. I was There was a scheduling conflict, and I was uh, hosting another session. Uh, so... Just very briefly on the UNESCO recommendation on the ethics of AI. Uh, it was developed through a multi-stakeholder process over a period of two years. Uh, the recommendation itself, we had a group of 24 experts which were selected from around the world who prepared the first draft. This draft was widely consulted with different stakeholder groups in different regions, in different languages, and then uh, the document went through an intergovernmental process of about 200 hours of negotiations. And then we had this as the first global normative instrument on artificial intelligence, which was adopted in 2021 by 193 countries. Uh, as far as the structure of this recommendation goes, uh, maybe it's, it's worth spending a little bit of time of why we are talking about ethics and uh, so when we are talking about technologies, uh, there, there are different kind of views of how we see technology. One is a very deterministic view of technology, that you, you have technology, it will guide our life, and it will do things. Then we have a very uh, instrumentalist view of technology, which is like, oh, it's just a tool, and it's up to us on how we use it and what we do with it. And then there's a third view of technology, which is kind of a, like technology is a mediating force in society. So not only is technology influencing our actions, but also we are influencing how, how technology is shaping the world. So let me give you an example. Uh, at a very micro level, we know speed breakers, right? They force us to slow down. It's a technology which is embedded with a script. Uh, at a macro level, if uh, in a classroom you have a teacher and then you put a robot there uh, to assist in the teaching, won't our ideas of what teaching and learning looks like, what is the role of a teacher in our world, also start shifting? So there's a, there's a shift which will happen in terms of norms. Now, when we talk about ethics, it's not just about saying, okay, these are the principles. We need to go into why, because Companies, uh, developers, all the people who are developing and using AI, per se, are embedding technology with certain scripts. And these scripts need to be informed by ethical values and principles that we want. And this is what the recommendation does. It talks about values of human rights. It talks about uh, leaving no one behind. It talks about sustainability. And then it goes into articulating the principles around transparency, explainability. And once we talk about these principles, it gives a clear indication to the developers, users, OK, this is how the technology should interface with us. Now, it goes on further than to talk about 
the policy areas and what specifically needs to be done, for instance, in the domain of education, in the domain of communication and information. We have so much misinformation, disinformation going around. So it's, it, it's, a, it's a very uh, beautiful document, I would say, but, uh, and I would invite you to look at it. Now, how are we going to, this, to address the, the second part of your question, Timia? How are we going about addressing the implementation part? Because that's where the change uh, would hopefully happen. Uh, the recommendation itself calls for the development of certain tools, uh, a readiness assessment methodology, which, is being, uh, which has been developed by UNESCO to look at where do countries stand vis-a-vis -vis their state of AI development, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the policy areas and so on in the recommendation. And this uh, is ongoing in about 50 countries around the world. And next year, in 2024, we'll have the second global forum on the ethics of AI, where, which will be a platform in February, which will be a platform to learn from what's, what's coming up around in different parts of the world. Another tool is an ethical impact assessment, and there are so many of these tools, and that is wonderful to have so many diverse perspectives. This is really to guide uh, companies, to guide governments who are procuring AI systems on what are the ethical aspects you need to look at, what at each stage of the AI life cycle, what do we need to be concerned about. Going forward, I think capacity building was also mentioned by Owen. We don't need to wait for these kind of regulations to be put in place to start working on capacity building. Uh, as an example, we are working with the judiciary. Uh, and the judiciary can actually, even in a lot of countries where you don't have AI, in most countries actually, we don't have any kind of AI regulation, uh, they can rely on existing human rights frameworks or other laws like data protection laws to start addressing the challenges around bias, discrimination, or privacy, and so on. So at UNESCO, we are working with a network of, we've been working with the judiciary for over 10 years, uh, and we have reached over, over 35,000 judicial operators over these 10 years in 160 countries on issues related to freedom of expression, access to information, safety of journalists, and in 2020, we started working on AI and the rule of law. And uh, we have uh, now a, a massive open online course, which was used by about 5,000 judicial operators. When I say judicial operators, means judges, lawyers, prosecutors, uh, people working in legal administrations on what are the opportunities of using AI in the judicial system. So use cases around case management, uh, we caution them about predictive justice, but also what are the broader human rights and legal implications of this technology and how can they address those challenges? Because you'll also start seeing binding judgments and we are already seeing this coming around. And we're working specifically with regional human rights courts uh, in Europe, in Latin America, in Africa, so that uh, when we have those judgments coming on, it, it percolates down to the national level. Uh, and finally, I will say, the work that we're doing, we are doing around capacities for civil servants. We keep on loading civil servants and governments with a lot of new work, complex, uh, volatile, uh, uncertain environments and ask them to work on regulation and implementing them without really equip equipping them with the necessary skills. We saw the case in Netherlands, uh, even the RoboDebt uh, scam scandal in Australia, where uh, AI systems were used and uh, thousands of people were de deprived of public benefits and which had very serious implications. So uh, these duty bearers, we need to work with them on strengthening their capacity. So we developed an AI and digital transformation competency framework for civil servants. And in fact, I was this morning, uh, we were launching a dynamic coalition on uh, digital capacity building, which will focus uh, on capacities for civil servants. So I'll stop here and uh, happy to go on later, yeah. Thank you so much, Pratik. There was a lot there uh, to unpack, but what particularly uh, was striking in your comments that um, we don't need to wait 
for AI regulation to start addressing some of those biases that we sometimes see coming out in AI systems. Um, uh, and I think that, that that is something to, to note here. Um, we finally have a full panel. As you can see, we, <laughs> we've expanded beyond the door, uh, the, the table. Um, I'm sorry that most of you are sitting so uncomfortably. Uh, but uh, yeah, we, <laughs> we really packed everything in here. Um, Welcome, uh, Dr. Center, um, uh, to, to the conversation. Uh, we've been really jumping between national and international frameworks and how do we set some of these guidelines, norms, how do we implement them, and having this conversation. And we started this morning with, with a poll um, on how aware uh, some of the audience is uh, here by some of the, the initiatives that are in place at national and international levels. We haven't asked them about the White House framework, but we did ask them about um, the NIST risk assessment framework. Um, and I have to say that was the um, the one that the, 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 pan, the audience was least aware of. Uh, it was a 3.9 awareness on a scale of 10. Um, so uh, with that introduction, <laughs> uh, not, not, to, not to say that it, anything wrong with the framework, but it might need a little bit of refresher for the audience. Um, and, and what the US uh, is doing, I think uh, the audience is keen to hear from you on how the US is, is positioning on, around um, uh, AI governance, AI uh, frameworks uh, at the national, at the international level, and what are some of the um, approaches that you're taking. Thank you, and I'm sorry I was late. I think your, your taxi must have been faster than mine coming from our previous event. Um, so sp spe speed and, and regulation are in natural tension. I think we know that in an AI context. We know that in any technological uh, governance framework. It's most conspicuous right now because of the intensification of political and cultural attention on AI and the seeming inadequacy of governments to meet the moment or at least perception that they're not moving uh, fast enough. And so I think that that dynamic is is one is exactly the right one uh, to frame the session around. Um, in the United States, um, we have two founding foundational documents that preceded the chat GPT moment uh, that came out uh, in the last two years. One is the AI Bill of Rights, uh, which provides a socio-technical framework for dealing with automated systems that is sector agnostic. So in other words, how do we think about uh, a, risk, a risk framework for any kind of automated system? And the other is the risk management framework, which scored a 3.9. What is the highest we can score? 5.9 with the OECD. Five, five, well, we, okay, well next year we will. We were going to come after the, if Audrey, if Audrey was here, we would come after her and go for a 5.9 next year. The risk management framework, which shares some commonalities with the OECD framework insofar it's multi-stakeholder, 240 organizations contributed over 18 months. It was a rigorous effort to solicit views from industry, civil society, to create a framework for users, uh, all the way from users to developers across the entire AI lifecycle to manage risk. Those preceded the moment in which all of us are here filling these rooms to talk about AI. What happened, and I think this happened at a national level and a global level, is that many of us forgot all of the work that had been done prior to uh, foundation models emerging and all of the hard work uh, and valuable work that had been done before that. And uh, so all of us lurched into a new political moment, a new cultural moment, precipitated by the belief that we're in a new technological era, or at least new era of AI. In the United States, obviously, uh, a lot of the leading companies that were developing uh, large language models, frontier models, um, are located there. And so we felt uh, in, it was incumbent on the United States to move quickly. Uh, as many of you know, it is a unlikely that we will rapidly move to legislation. I think that's the case in many countries. But we realized that the moment required action, and it required action that defined the problem in a new way, and then set obligations around uh, the developers of frontier models. And so over the course of the spring and summer, uh, the White House uh, talked to these developers of frontier models, tried to understand and define the nature of the unique risks posed by these models as distinct from, or at least 
um, in addition to the more um, basic, substantial, but, but understood risks posed by AI that we've been talking about for several years, and then tried to create a, te a technically informed framework for dealing with them. And that emerged as something called the voluntary commitments, which uh, companies have signed on to in the United States in two waves. And essentially, it asks companies to undertake a series of obligations to um, responsibly manage in a secure, trustworthy way their AI systems. What does it entail? Some very, I think, what we would now consider fairly um, understandable basic steps at a level of principles, but I think when we get into the question of implementation, it gets quite, quite complicated very quickly. So the commitments essentially require things like red teaming, information sharing among the frontier model developers so that as they discover emergent risks, they can share them with each other. So, they'll, so each, each company or developer will understand them. It includes basic principles of cybersecurity and cyber hygiene with the, with the belief and logic that uh, the model weights that essentially provide the power around these finished models are, are sufficiently important to protect that companies need to treat them essentially as the crown jewels of their IP. Um, it includes um, disclosure, public, public transparency and disclosure. So in other words, if you think about a basic idea like a nutrition card for a food product, you would want to disclose the basic information about how a model's been trained, how powerful it is, so everyone sort of understands the, uh, the, the power of the model itself. And the idea is this combination of internal technical work and external transparency will generate the kind of trust and security that we need as these models continue to rapidly evolve. And prior to, or as a bridge to, a legal or regulatory framework in which we can deal with them in a more substantial way. This is a bridge, it's a first step. I think if we were to um, solicit a poll, I think one thing people have focused on is the voluntary aspect as opposed to the technical criteria under, underneath the voluntary aspect. I think if you actually look at the technical criteria, it's quite a serious effort by um, the engineers, computer scientists, designers, to come to terms with what they're building. And I would suggest it probably represents the best technical framework for thinking about the era we're moving into, even if I think there's gonna be extraordinary um, diversity in the kinds of legal approaches we take in the coming era. Thank you so much for that, and thank you for, for joining us uh, <laughs> in your very busy schedule. Um, it's, I think, I hope that this would, maybe we should ask the question again at the end uh, and see <laughs> if, this, if this improves the numbers of the understanding um, of some of the frameworks. But um, I think what's very useful for us to note that um, commitments and work on this um, don't just come out of the blue. It's really built on, uh, on a long-standing um, conversations around the topic uh, beyond the boom moment of uh, when when AI really became so user friendly that we all, all of us are using it now uh, on our phones every day, um, but but really uh, it's based on considerations and conversations that have been coming from from such a, a long while, and it does bring together um, not just policymakers or the policy teams in in, in companies, but uh, the engineers. Um, and those uh, who set some of the technical work and the technical standards as well. Um, so with that, I think that's a good segue to, to turn to Clara and, and, and ask how, um, how does this work in, in, in global standard setting bodies, uh, such as uh, uh, IEEE, and, and, and how do you think about uh, some of the <laughs> AI challenges in, in your work? Thank you for uh, having me here. It's a pleasure. Um, yeah, so uh, as, as it comes to the polls, uh, the question is, of course, what is our role here? Um, and uh, I would like to maybe echo what we just heard, that uh, it needs actually both a bottom-up approach as well as a top-down approach. And uh, um, IEEE started probably the same time as Japan, uh, already in 2016, 
uh, to think about what are the ethical challenges of uh, technology. Um, and it came because we have a constituency of 400,000 members. We are the largest technical association, so we're not only a standard-setting body, but we are uh, uh, an association of technologies. So this realization that there is a responsibility uh, in creating this technology, uh, which uh, really, I have to say, it's not, it's not neutral. It is really embodying the values of and business models of those that created, that we have a responsibility. And... Um, uh, that this is how this initiative in IEEE of ethical aligned design came to existence. Uh, it is it was about um, um, well identifying issues and how we can deal with them we as technologists and how we can deal with them in um, in uh, discussions with regulatory bodies. Um, so what happened since then is that we developed a set of socio technical standards. We are already. Uh, been developing a lot of technical standards, including the Wi-Fi standard that you are uh, using right now. But when it comes to social technical standards, it is a completely different uh, discussion because uh, what we heard here, we need to have then this uh, multi-stakeholder approach. So we have in our uh, standard setting bodies now um, people that were not uh, accustomed to this and we had to um, develop a common terminology, of course, when it comes to value-based design. Uh, when it comes to what does it mean to transparency. Everybody agrees that transparency is important, but what does it actually mean? Um, and what is it, um, first of all, what we want to achieve and how we are actually achieving it at the technical level? Uh, so um, the set of standards, as I said, one is um, on value-based design. Um, it, it is really around identifying what are the values or expectations of the stakeholders of an AI system for a given context and how you are actually prioritizing them because there is, uh, you cannot have everything uh, in, built into the system, how you are actually prioritizing them and how you are translating them into concrete system, uh, uh, system requirements. Uh, and I think it's about uh, also practice and experience. Since then, uh, we have several projects, including public-private uh, partnership projects from UNICEF, but also including um, uh, industry, which prove that it is a very valuable standard and giving this methodology to developers and system designers, which actually influences the outcome of the system. So you actually come up with a different system which takes this value into account. As I already said, um, when it comes to transparency, we have a standard which defines transparency. There are different levels of transparency, uh, so it, it gives a common terminology when we speak about these terms. The same thing if, if it goes to bias. We are discussing about bias and that we have to, uh, we have to exclude bias uh, and, and deal with it. But again, we don't know what, what bias is for a certain uh, context. For instance, when we are going to a medical application, we actually want to have a certain bias. We want to have, for instance, uh, different treatment of women and men because we have different symptoms. So we need to have that, uh, that kind of context sensitivity when it comes to certain things that we all agree on. But then, uh, so this was the bottom-up approach. And the question is, how does it come together with a top-down approach with all these uh, different frameworks that we uh, are also heard and uh, and the poll uh, very clearly show that uh, people know more or less about it. So we engaged also from the beginning um, with the OECD, with uh, the EU and at the high level expert group, with the uh, Council of Europe and uh, so I, I would say when it comes to this question that, of course, um, industry has, what is the interoperability when it comes to regulatory requirements, I think the standards will play a very important role because that gives the, um, let's say, the very practical approach, how to move to, to what, from principles to practice. And we are part of the discussion. So we are, uh, we are, we are uh, part of the network of, of experts giving, let's say, um, the technical background of what is, you know, what are the challenges, what is possible uh, to implement, what is realistic, and also uh, reflecting it in, the, in our standards. Um, and I wanted to uh, give also an example of how this uh, complementary uh, between regulation and, and standards can work. Um, when it comes to children, uh, we have, um, uh, there is a code which is in the UK, the Children's Act, 
uh, which gives, let's say, and this is something where, of course, technologists cannot um, decide for themselves what is the right way to do it. I think this is something that needs to be done in a democratic process. So for the children's schools, everybody agrees we need to protect children. But again, what does it mean on that technical level? And uh, we have a, a standard which is called age-appropriate design, which complements that regulation. And I think that this is, and which gives also very clear uh, guidance on how to do this uh, age verification and so on. So I think that this is the bottom-up approach and a top-down approach needs to come together. And another example is um, that we are doing at the EU level is how to map the AI Act requirements to the standards. There is also a report which came out uh, from the Joint Research Center of the European Union which made this mapping for IEEE standards and actually said that it fills really this gap when it comes to ethics because a lot of standards um, are still, uh, of course, um, um, focusing on more, more technical level, which is also important, but you need both. Um, yes, um, I would end up with capacity building. I think that is very important uh, for our certification process, uh, which complements the standards. Uh, we started uh, building up an ecosystem, an ecosystem of um, uh, assessors. We already trained more than 100 people. And what is also important that we have to have certifications of products and services, but also certification of people. So we need uh, these assessors, uh, which are already in our registries. Uh, and we need also certification bodies. So we actually trained uh, some well, uh, people from certification bodies to be able to make these assessments as well. So I think that these are the things that we are, will continue doing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Clara. Um, and, and thank you for, uh, for sharing all, all of that from your work um, and, and making that connection between the bottom-up and top-down approaches. Um, I guess capacity building is also in the middle or around all of this to make sure it all fits and that we all have all the necessary skills um, and capacities to deal with that. As we're going, I'm going to turn to our last two speakers for today. So I would like to encourage you to please go online and type your questions or comments into um, the chat box so that we can weave that into the discussion as I will give a last round to the panelists to react to one another and to your questions. Um, I'd love to uh, see some of them pop up here. Um, uh, the chat has been a bit silent, but do, um, do go online and share your questions so that we make sure that we weave some of the perspectives in the room as well. And with that, um, I'm going to turn to, to Maria Paz um, and ask, um, you are here on a panel representing civil society. Um, a, you work a lot on um, some of these uh, issues that we've mentioned, in particular human rights. Um, how does that um, come in um, to, to the discussion from your perspective? What are some of the challenges and opportunities that we have here? Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation for being here. Um, I think that the benefit of being almost at the end of the <laughs> round of uh, speakers is that I can uh, build on top of what already had been said and, and add uh, the component that is specific, specific for the perspective of the um, civil society organization that we work in the space of um, digital governance. And I think that I am very pleased of many concepts that I have heard from different actors here around the table, uh, starting for the concept of a socio-technical approach to the artificial intelligence governance. And I would like to believe that it's technology governance at large, not only for artificial intelligence. Um, and I think that one of the other things that have resonated in, in all the intervention that I have heard so far is the need of this clarification in terms of the framework and how they translate to concrete way uh, to engage with the, with the manner in which um, the, the design, the, but also the deployment and the adoption for many uh, countries uh, um, of the artificial intelligence technologies is happening. So I think that um, we need, on top of, what, of some of the elements that Clara was mentioning, for example, about the concept of what we mean by transparency, what we mean by bias, also I think that we need to understand, have a, like a more um, clear understanding in terms of frameworks about what kind of risk we are addressing. 
what we are considering really a risk. From uh, the work that I represent in the organization that I work on, uh, we try to infuse in this conversation the human rights approach. And we consider that the risk that we are uh, addressing when we are talking about the impacts of artificial intelligence, it's the, the, the huge uh, and, and, and wide spectrum of impact that this technology is, ha is having in, in the daily life of every people around the world that is touched by the technology. And this, touch uh, the exercise of uh, civil and political rights in a very concrete manner, but also increasingly the exercise of economic, social, and cultural rights also. So when we see that many uh, places in the world, and particularly governments, and are embracing the use of artificial technologies for um, developing policies in different areas, we wonder if we are talking about the right risk when we are measuring. And if, uh, for example, in, uh, in what Galia was uh, mentioning, that it had been this very thorough work uh, conducted by the OECD in terms of like building the database, are we really co concentrating enough in hearing also from the right people in terms of like how those um, risk and, and, and uh, possibilities of risk uh, are being measured? So I think that in the example that um, that Clara was giving uh, related to technical community, the, the bottom-up approach implied to hear the technical expert, and also it's something that it was uh, um, pointed out by Mr. Santer in terms of the how you build this voluntary commitment, like trying to be really st strong in terms of the technical aspect and of the recommendations of the, the guidance. And, and you, Clara, were mentioning that it's necessary to hear the technical expert in order to really uh, make the, um, the assessment converge with what is technically feasible and technically understandable for the ones that are called to implement it. The same way we should be thinking how uh, the risk is connected with the different communities that is impacting for the deployment of the technology. And usually those are not in the room. Usually they are, those are not consulted and even like I acknowledge the good effort that have been done in many consultative process, for example, for building the UNESCO uh, recommendations, ethical recommendation, and also in the process of the NIST uh, um, um, risk assessment framework that I have the, the, the privilege to participate representing some consideration from civil society groups. Usually, who are part of those conversations are not the people that it's the bottom line in terms of impact of the deployment of the technology in society. So I think that uh, we should continue to make it a, a conscious effort to have that people in the room, to bring them into the conversation. This is also related with the capacity building uh, uh, issue that has been raised by several of you. We cannot expect that people is able to talk about how uh, artificial intelligence impact in their daily life if we don't approach them to the topic in a way that is really concrete for them and understandable. We will not expect that they speak the language of the technical standard. We will not expect that they speak the language of the regulatory issues, but they will talk about how they have been discriminating in the, in, in the access of housing or employment or access to health or education or how the use of this technology is being uh, um, weaponized for political manipulation or uh, state control and surveillance of uh, opposic, uh, opposition uh, forces in, in a specific country. So I think that I am very happy of what <laughs> I am hearing in this, in, 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 around this table, but I think that there is still some kind of um, additional work in terms of the clarity of the frameworks of what we are, uh, what we are addressing, what we are understanding in terms of risk. Um, and at the end, when we use the, the concept of responsible uh, AI or trustworthy AI, for me, those are not tags that uh, are uh, really useful in terms of like unpacking what it should be done in terms of like um, addressing the governance artificial intelligence issues. Those will be the result of like unpacking in a good way the governance issue. And as a result of a good governance, in my perspective with a human rights approach, we will have responsible technologies and we will have trustworthy artificial intelligence. So I will leave it there for the next round of reaction, but very happy to be here. Thank and you. Bring that perspective. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> thank you, Maria Paz. Uh, first round of applause. We're not at the end just yet because we have to hear from Thomas. And I think you set uh, him up for a very 
a difficult question because, Thomas, in, in addition to working on these issues uh, in your home country, in Switzerland, uh, you're also chairing uh, the process at the Council of Europe um, that is coming up with the first binding convention on AI and human rights. Um, so I'm not going to ask all of the questions that Maria Paz asked of you <laughs> because it will be very difficult to answer in the five minutes that you have. Uh, but how, how is that process considering some of the, the human rights impact and, and what do you expect from it? Yes, uh, thank you. And uh, it's actually it's actually good that we live in a hybrid world. So I was able to follow the discussion and the poll already from the taxi through uh, new technologies like Zoom meetings. Uh, and, and so, uh, yes, hello, hello, everybody. Happy to, to be here. Um, first of all, uh, thanks uh, to, to, to the ICC for, for putting this together, because I don't think it's a problem that we have several ways, several instruments to try and cope with, with a new technology. And I think this is, this is the only way to go because there's not one single instrument that will solve all the problems or enable all the opportunities when it comes to a, to a new technology. So we need a mix of instruments. And we also should not forget that we already have uh, technical norms, legal norms, cultural norms that guide our societies and that have guided us with previous technologies that have also been maybe more or less disruptive. Uh, and so we do not have to reinvent the wheel every time something new comes up. We may have to adjust it or maybe add uh, a little bit to, to the wagon, but, but it's not, not everything is completely new. So we, it's good to see what is new and what is not new or what is maybe a, a, a new version of something that we may already uh, know. And actually, if you look at, at AI, in many ways you can actually compare it in its di disruptiveness uh, that AI is replacing uh, cognitive human work through machines. AI is, is, is a, a driver, is an engine that drives uh, other machines, you can actually uh, uh, compare it in a number of ways to, to actually the combustion engines and their disruptive effect that they had a few uh, uh, 150 or 200 uh, years ago and actually un until now. Because also there, you don't have one law that is regulating all engines uh, worldwide at once. You have thousands of technical, legal and cultural norms that are actually most of them not focusing on the engine itself but on the machine that the, is, the engine is driven by, or on the people that are actually guiding the machine, on the infrastructure that the machines are using, and uh, for instance, and, and there's different levels of harmonization be, uh, between these rules. If you take machines that move people uh, in the airline business, you have quite a harmonized set of rules across the world. If you take cars, Looking at my German friends here, they think that they can still uh, live without speed limits, and apparently they don't live that badly without speed limits. In my country, uh, it's slightly different. The US has even lower speed limits than we do. Uh, so, uh, and some people drive on the left side of the streets, but they can, the British or the Japanese can drive on Swiss roads. They just have to pay more attention. So there's different levels of, of interoperability or harmonization according to the specific application of an engine in a particular machine that is used for a particular purpose. It's also there's a difference whether you, you move uh, goods or you move people, there may be different requirements and so on and so forth. And we are about to do the same with AI in the sense that we try not to regulate the tool itself, but the tool in the context that it's applied. And the tool may evolve very quickly, but maybe the context is not so quickly changing because in the end it's, it's, it's people and people tend to not so evolve so quickly uh, as, as, as maybe the tools, which should actually make it easier for us to try and understand the processes that we're in. <clears throat> and uh, what the Council of Europe is doing is trying to fill one piece to add to, to this set of norms where we have technical norms that may be uh, one element to actually react quickly to developments and, and solve issues on a technical level to the extent it's feasible to create a certain harmonization, to create a certain level of, of security also, of predictability of systems. 
Um, the cultural norms is something else that I will not, I don't have the time to go beyond German motorways, but um, we also may have different ways of dealing with risks in general in, in different societies. And then you have the legal, the legal space where it is great to have industry players taking on responsibilities to regulate themselves. Uh, it is good to have guiding uh, soft law guidance from UNESCO, from the OECD. The Council of Europe has also developed since 2018 a number of sectoral instruments like an ethical charter on the use of AI in the judicial system, um, a recommendation on human rights impacts on, of, of uh, AI systems in, 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 uh, in the field of media and, and elsewhere. So this is all fine, but it may not be enough because, um, and I will be very curious to see how these voluntary commitments uh, are followed in the US, because voluntary means like you can, but you don't really have to. Well, there may be, if the incentives are right, a voluntary system may actually work better than a so-called compulsory system if, if, if it's uh, too complicated or unworkable. So I, I don't necessarily say that this is not a good approach, but again, I think it's, it's good that we have different approaches and while the European Union has decided to develop an instrument that is basically a market regulatory instrument, the Council of Europe, for those that are not familiar with the European system, the Council of Europe is not the European Union. It is something that is comparable to, the, to a UN for, for Europe. And uh, uh, it is 46 member states that have agreed on a set of norms on human rights, democracy, and rule of law. There's about 250 conventions and uh, thousands of soft law instruments. And so the latest, one of the latest things is that we are trying to agree on a number of very high level principles that are probably not that different from other high level principles that we've already seen in a convention. And the new thing is that this is the first intergovernmental agreement that states commit themselves to live up to these principles. And these principles are based on the norms of human rights, democracy and rule of law. And what is special in, in, in this case, but there have been others before, is that this is not a convention just for European countries, for member states, for the 46 member states of the Council of Europe. It is an open process where we had already from the beginning a number of non-European countries that are leading in AI, like the US, Israel, Japan, Canada. We have also uh, uh, Mexico on board since the beginning. We have a, a number of, of, of other countries joining, in particular from Latin America. Um, so this is, the Council of Europe has the opportunity to offer a tool where states from all over the world that respect the same values of human rights, democracy and rule of law, but may have different institutional arrangements to do this, uh, to join, become parties to a convention where we agree on a number of principles um, to, that should guide us. And it's not just human rights, it's things that are slightly more complicated because they are not that clearly institutionalized like democracy. Um, and to agree on a number of principles. And then, this is one thing because that will be another paper, but we also work uh, together with the OS OECD, together with, with uh, a number of standardization uh, institutions, together with the EU, and together also with, with, with we are also watching what, what the US colleagues are doing in the NIST framework, because in the end you need to have something that operationalizes paper. And, and so what we uh, are calling this is a Hudera Human Rights, Democracy and Rule of Law Impact Assessment, which is not a particular tool, but it's an, a methodology that should help us unite and like create interoperable systems in our countries, like the convention is a legal tool that should help us create interoperable legal systems within our countries. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thomas. Um, and, and I very much like your analogy there with the, with the roads uh, systems. Uh, we need some of the common principles. We all know what to do and learn, to learn how to drive and, and know how to drive and what are the general rules, but then we need the flexibility to be able to adapt to context. And, uh, and I think that that uh, does apply nicely to some of these systems. Um, we have, um, I'm going to be generous, 10 minutes left, uh, actually seven. Um, and I'm going, we have a lot of speakers, but the audience has been gracious with us because they don't seem to have many questions. So what I'm going to ask, uh, of you is to take a one minute, and I've set the timer, one minute each to take your um, last comments, reactions to the other statements. 
uh, or to share uh, one lesson learned or recommendation from your side. And I'm going to go uh, from that side to that side, and you'll see how many minutes you uh, we are running over um, uh, as as we get to the, <laughs> the end of the queue. So please be respectful of your fellow panelists, uh, so that we do have time to go to everyone. Um, Patik. I would rather give my one minute if someone has a question because it's too heavy on the panel. Yes, please. Hi, yeah, um, Ansgar Kuhn from EY. Um, I had problems with submitting the question. Um, yeah, my question was around the uh, capacity building side and actually less the capacity building from the point of view of getting the skills of doing it, but rather from the point of view of enabling various parties to engage with the process because of the time commitments that are re related to that, which means either cost for being able to afford to have somebody in your organization, if you're an SME or something, or a civil society organization, you might not be able to carry that cost of someone who isn't contributing directly to whatever the product is that you're creating. Or if you're in academia, you may struggle to um, get academic credit for having engaged in this kind of a process. So does anybody have any suggestions in that space? So I will Go quickly ahead. answer within my 30 seconds left and give back the floor. So, uh, so I think from, from our perspective, uh, whenever we are having multi-stakeholder conversations, we are very sensitive to the fact that not everyone is coming with the same level of knowledge about the technology. And we put out some guidance from UNESCO on how to do multi-stakeholder governance of AI in a manner which is more inclusive. So which includes first building awareness. Uh, we ourselves have launched uh, quite a number of knowledge products to facilitate that process. For instance, in a fun way, we have a comic book on AI because we hear this very often that when you are in a multi-stakeholder conversation, not everyone is as familiar with the topic. Some people feel maybe a bit intimidated when you are having the technical experts, the government and everyone coming from the IOs, talking in their own jargon, which uh, is sometimes very hard to decipher. So we, we are sensitive to this concern. We've also supported people to participate in different fora, so that uh, financially, but also financially compensate them for the time, because uh, civil society ends up doing a lot of free work in these consultative processes without uh, any any kind of financial support. And I know colleagues that we are meeting here working on weekends, working nights in civil society, which is which is not fair at all. So quick. Thank, thank you for the question. Thank you, Pratik. We have four minutes left, but I'm yeah. going to take one more uh, question. I think maybe it's easier if, if we all ask the question than any panel member can just touch on it. If, uh, if, uh, I think that's in four minutes, yes, sure, yeah. go ahead. Uh, so, so my name is Li Ming Zhu. I'm from CSRO, Australian National Science Agency. We're working on the science of a responsible AI. I have a question on the system level guardrails versus the model level guardrails. We, also, we all know that uh, risks are context specific, uh, but a lot of people worry if uh, we push the responsibility uh, to the system level, to the users, uh, then the uh, tech vendors can provide an unsafe model, so the response would be in your uh, legal appliance to do that. On the other hand, uh, all the model level guardrails, because you know, the generative AI is hard to understand, it's hard to embed uh, specific rules inside a black box model, and we need system level um, guardrails. I'm just uh, wondering whether there's any comments. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen, 30 seconds for your question, please. <laughs> Uh, hi, uh, I'm Steve Park I'm from Roblox. Um, I understand that the previously the G20 process has created something like the data free flow with trust. I'm wondering what the Hiroshima process, is there an expectation for that sort of a principal approach uh, for AI as well? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I guess that the, our online system was not really good on taking questions, but I'm so glad to have that engagement. 30 seconds each panelist to try and answer. All right, race is on. Very good question about um, models versus applications. I, you, you, need, you need safeguards at both levels. You need to make sure that you're developing the model in a responsible way, but then when you're integrating that into an application, you also need to make sure that there are requirements at that level as well. Otherwise, the mitigations that you've put in at the model level can, can just be removed or circumvented. So we think there's been great progress on the code this week for developers. We think ultimately you need to um, extend that to deployers as well. 
And I, I guess 15 seconds to offer some thoughts on a way forward in terms of global governance. I think there has been a ton of progress made over the last 12 months. I think that's been reflected in the conversation here. I think as we, we move forward, we should think about ultimately where do we want to get to? What do we want a global governance regime to do? And what can we learn from existing regimes? So to offer a few thoughts, I think we want a sort of framework for standard setting globally. I think organizations like the International Civil Aviation Organization, where you have a representative process for, for developing standards that are then implemented at a domestic level, really, really helpful. I think we want to have conversations to advance a consensus on risk. I think of organizations like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which might be a good, um, uh, a good model uh, to follow. And then I think ultimately we want to keep building that infrastructure. So both the technical infrastructure so that we can advance work on evaluations where we have still really major gaps to, um, to address, but also continuing to have these types of conversations. The point that you were making, making sure we have a, a representative way of having these conversations on global governance and, and pulling in um, perspectives from across the world, I think is going to be really important. Thank you, okay. Owen. Very, very efficient and, and speedy well, in quickly, response, as quickly, the private least. sector generally is. Um, no, Busan, please. Uh, uh, thank you. Then uh, answering the question, then maybe I would say like in the uh, back in the 16, it's more like a Japan started initiated the discussion, but uh, this time in you know, the for the Hiroshima process, it's uh, I would say it's a G7's collective effort. So, and uh, the main point is like a uh, focus is generative way and the foundation model. Then then the, the I mean the back in the slide, and then it's more like about the voluntary commitment. So maybe just uh, you can see that some shifting of the the discussion even in the G7. So the, what I expect is just more like, a, you know, started by the government of Japan, but now it's all inclusive dialogue around the G7 and around the OECD other, other for as well. So I'm just, the Japan will, will say that uh, we are very happy to see what happened, even though we, we already have some things that we didn't expect in the 16, but still I would say that the things are going well around and we have to continue this kind of dialogue among the whole world. Thank you. Thank you, Nausan. Clara. So very quickly, um, I think that uh, we need uh, really um, to balance between voluntary and, um, and uh, legal uh, requirements. I think that it is not the responsibility of the private sector to um, have guard lists for um, democracy and rule of law, for instance. So if we want to um, have uh, you know, certainty on this, we need a legal certainty as well. So we need to have uh, regulation on these uh, issues as much as possible. And I think that this legal certainty is also uh, expected from the private sector. I think that uh, what is really uh, bad right now is the certainty, uh, the uncertainty that they are facing. Um, and um, just um, yeah, uh, responding to one of the answers, I think that how to engage, um, what I think is going to be essential is to enable feedback loops. I think that this is going to be one of the most important things of uh, especially working with generative AI, enabling these feedback loops and making sure that these uh, feedbacks is actually taken into account uh, by um, retraining systems or uh, taking them into account when, um, yeah, when um, learning from uh, the aviation industry. So uh, the benchmarking, I think, is also important and, and common standards, <laughs> of course. So. Thank you. So I'm going to take on your points also. One of the examples in which it's evident that we need some level of com complementarity in between voluntary standards and legal frameworks, it's particularly linked with one of the questions around this responsibility at different levels of uh, the safeguard. Uh, being in the design stage, but also in the implementation and functioning of the system. So, for example, that's a topic that should be considered as a part of the regulation, how we distribute and we create uh, obligations related with transparency in the information that were mentioned also by Mr. Center uh, related to the voluntary commitment, how we ensure that between the different operators in the change of, of uh, use, production, and use of the artificial intelligence, there's also enough communication that is not against the competition rules also, or the intellectual property rules, but they are shared responsibility and the framework, legal framework, account for those different responsibilities. Um, 15 seconds yep. on the role, I, I talk a, a little bit more in, during my intervention about this um, uh, need of like um, the bottom uh, up approach in terms of like societies and different stakeholders in society, but it also applies uh, geopolitical 
practically at the global level. In this conversation that are unfolding at the global level of discussion of governance, we need to hear much more about global South uh, experiences from different stakeholders that make this process of identification of risk and relevant elements in context much more sensitive to different considerations. Let's stop there. Thank you so much, Mary Pais. And I don't try to silence anyone, but we're making our gracious host very, very anxious. So three minutes, please. Three minutes. No, one <laughs> one um, minute each, no, three I'm minutes kidding. together. Um, but just to say, I think this, this has been a really, really rich conversation. It's also made me optimistic that I think it is possible. I think we do have all the elements uh, combined. I really like what Thomas said about sort of how all these things can be complementary. I do think um, there are still challenges sort of at the implementation level, um, how we make these things work. Um, I think sort of mapping exercises like the, what we did with the OECD on the risk assessment front, I hope, um, can be helpful in this regard. I also think we can think about what we mean by sort of when we say global governance, then um, how global can we do it and sort of maintain like a, 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 a credible value alignment, which I think is very important. I think we also have the element of the, the stakeholder engagement that's really important. I think this kind of forum is, is really um, critical in advancing this, this kind of conversation. So thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I try also to, to talk in two uh, time speed, like the YouTube videos that you can watch double the speed. Um, well, I think we need to work on, on several levels. One is we need to reiterate and see whether we still agree on fundamental values about how we want to respect our human dignity, how we want to be innovative while respecting rights, and see that we are all on the same page on this. And then we somehow need to break it down and see, okay, what is the new, what are the new elements, what are the new challenges, what are the legal uncertainties that we need to clarify, and then how do we best clarify them without uh, creating a, a, a burdensome bureaucracy? Uh, how do we clarify, what can we do with technical standards? What, what is the best tool for solving the problem? So we need to know what are the problems, and then we need to know what are the best tools. And again, it will probably be a mix of tools. Some will be faster, others will be more sustainable. And I think we're all working on it, and we need to just continue and cooperate with all stakeholders in their respective roles. Thank you so much, Thomas. Dr. Center, on the account of last words. <laughs> I feel like that's an awfully positive message to end on, so I will mercifully cede my, my 45 seconds back. Thank you. That's very gracious. Thank you so much. Uh, apologies for the next session and to the host for running five minutes over, but I really do want to thank the panel for making the time and coming here and for this really rich discussion. For the audience for sticking with us, I wish we had three more hours and we still couldn't have stopped talking, I'm sure. Um, but there is a main session on artificial intelligence, I'm told. So see you there <laughs> and see you around. Thank you so much again.